can the EU help protect women's and LGBT's rights? Uh, DEO, Demokrati i Europa, Oplysningsforbundet og The Democracy in Europe Organization is hosting this uh, online debate today. I'm Vibe Thermansen and, and uh, I'll be moderator. But since this is a Zoom meeting, an online meeting, we, we need some technical issues as well. And my colleague Tina Menzel is, is in charge of technical uh, technicalities. So Tina, will you please help us move? Yes, of course. Thank you, Vibe. Um, yes, as some of you might already have noticed, I will mute your sound uh, uh, on your videos uh, during the presentation so we avoid background noise. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't have the word uh, and ask questions because we open up for questions later after the presentations and during the meet meeting and also during the presentations, you can send me a message if you have a question because then I will put it on my list. I have a list where I list all of you who have questions, and then I will let you know when it's your turn to ask your question after the presentations. And to write a message to me, you have to go to the bar below where you can see there are different functions and there's a function called chat and you have to open the chat and write a question to me. Um, and if you don't have a microphone in your computer or your phone or iPad, then just let me know and then I can uh, ask the question for you. And it's nice to see that uh, many of, of you have cameras uh, on because it's nice that we can see each other uh, when we deba debate. So for those of you who haven't uh, turned on your cameras, it could be nice if you want to, but if you doesn't uh, want to, it's it is um, also okay. And then in the right corner, uh, you can see you have two options, uh, speaker view and gallery view. And if you choose speaker view, then you can see a big picture of the person who is talking at the moment. So if you have it on speaker view right now, you can see a big picture of me. But if you choose gallery view, then you can see a lot of uh, small pictures of all the participants who participate in this meeting. And lastly, I, um, we record this meeting and we'll put it on our YouTube channel afterwards because in that way, everyone can see the, uh, the debate afterwards, also the people who have been prevented uh, to participate in this meeting. Yes, thank you, Vibe. Thank you, Tina. Uh, today we have participants from, from Denmark and Poland, of course, and from Spain and France and Austria, uh, Great Britain, um, Romania, even South Africa. So I, I'm looking forward to hear English spoken in, in so many different ways today. Sylvia, I'm glad to see you as well. So welcome. I, I'd like to welcome my two guests today. That will be Kira Marie Peter Hansen, who is uh, Danish, a Danish member of the, of the European Parliament. Uh, you, you're from the Danish party, Socialistisk Folkeparti, uh, and, and you are in the European Parliament. You are in the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. Welcome, welcome Kira. And I'd like to welcome you as well, Sylvia Spurek. You are also a, a member of the European uh, Parliament. You're from Poland and you're independent. Uh, you are a lawyer and you've been working with women's rights for the last 20 years. And, and in the European Parliament, you hold the vice chair on, on the, in the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. So welcome both of you. I'd like to, I'd like to start by showing you a picture. So or actually, it's, it's several pictures. Um, th th these are pictures from last week. But uh, since, since October uh, last year, millions of Poles have, have been on the street demonstrating uh, about a new, a new law on abortion. And, and some of the, I wrote some of the signs here, some of the slogans that they were carrying. Uh, no woman, no cry. Abortion is health, health care. Girls just want to have fundamental human rights. And, and lots of lots of things. But but Sylvia, you're Polish and, and you are actually, I guess, in Warsaw now. So could you could you tell us what, what is happening? What do we have in these pictures? Why why do the Poles demonstrate in such large numbers? 
Uh, hello, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, debate and for this meeting. And I'm really happy that you are interested in the situation of Polish women, because uh, the situation is alarming. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to bear in mind that uh, three facts. First of all, uh, anti-abortion law in Poland, Polish anti-abortion law, is, uh, I think, one of the most severe in the whole European Union, but also uh, in the world. So this is one fact. The second fact uh, is that uh, even uh, if, this, the, if, if the law is so uh, restrictive, so severe, it, was, uh, it wasn't uh, implemented. It was adopted in 1993 and allowed uh, for termination of pregnancy in three cases. But even uh, if uh, you, uh, you were pregnant because of rape, uh, you, your, your life or health was uh, in danger, or the, uh, the, the, the fetal uh, defects uh, um, uh, or, or because of the fetal effects you wanted to have abortion, uh, your access to the abortion was limited because of the conscious clause of the physicians, because of all circumstances, because of the impact of Catholic Church in Poland. So this is the second fact. And the third fact, and this is actually the answer for your question, uh, is that uh, in October, the Constitutional Tribunal in Poland uh, ruled uh, about this anti-abortion law. Uh, and actually, uh, this judgment, um, this judgment uh, imposed de facto abortion ban uh, in Poland. Uh, last week, this, um, this judgment was published in the Journal of Laws in Poland, which means that this uh, judgment is binding. Uh, this judgment is actually the law. So um, we have this, uh, uh, this only these two situation when we can have abortion in Poland. So uh, ma uh, the, the woman... Uh, a woman's, he woman's health or life is in danger or the pregnancy as, uh, is a result of rape or incest. Uh, but the majority of all abortions in Poland was, uh, were conduct was conducted because of this, uh, of this uh, condition that was actually deleted by the judgment of constitutional tribunal. And that's why women and their allies went uh, on the street. But we need to also uh, remember that Polish people uh, ha ha have uh, been demonstrating on the streets for many years now because of the violations of the rule of law, because of the violations of the fundamental rights of LGBTI people, because of the violation of freedom of media. And now, uh, and this is uh, uh, actually one of the of the examples. Women and their allies uh, demonstrate uh, against this judgment and violations of fundamental rights of women. So this is the short story about the situation in Poland, and and I am at your disposal to to uh, answer your questions more. So, Christian, thank you, Sylvia. I, I saw some numbers from 2019. Uh, if this new law uh, applied in 2019, only 26 abortions would have been legal in, in Poland, and you're almost 40 million uh, inhabitants in, in Poland. Well, Kira, I'd like to ask you, uh, on our homepage, on Deo uh, Demokratie Europa's uh, homepage for this meeting, you have a profile picture and you're carrying a sign. And on that sign, it says, to jest wojna, that is Polish and means this is war. War is a very, very strong word in, in Danish terms, at least. 
What, why, why do you use that sign? Why do you carry that sign and use that word? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me and for making this debate. And also really happy to see so many people from across the whole world. Um, I, was, uh, I took this picture and posted it uh, primarily to show support to, to the Polish women uh, and to people striking in Poland. Uh, due to the coronavirus, of course, we couldn't be there in real life. Uh, so it's a way to show the support. Um, and with this picture, um, it's a reference to a Polish book uh, that's also uh, like discussing the more broad discussion about this, uh, stating that this fight that we are seeing is not a fight about religion or moral values, but instead a fight against uh, between powers um, and the power to suppress other people. Uh, so that is why it's calling for uh, saying that this is a war. And perhaps uh, Sylvia can also elaborate on that part just as she's standing in the middle on it. But I think for me, it means that like, you can have a lot of, of, of opinions and it's great that we uh, disagree on a lot of stuff. But when it comes to fundamental rights and human rights, if you begin to violate them, it's a crime against humanity and against human rights. And that needs uh, like a, an, a reaction from other people. So if we keep doing these, or if, or if the conservative governments keep suppressing people, it will lead to a war against uh, the, the human rights and also to a, a, a counter reaction from, from feminist activists. But, but Kira, you're in the European Parliament. What, what is the European Parliament doing uh, right now to, to protect women's rights in, in cases like this? Um, well, we're trying to do a lot of things. Uh, unfortunately, we can't just uh, tell the Polish government that they can't uh, enforce this law and other governments who are violating the, the human rights. Uh, what we've been doing with this is that we have uh, been a lot of MEPs signing that we want the Polish government to reject this bill. Uh, both Sylvia and I were also signing this petition. Uh, so we try to use a lot of diplomatic powers to show to the Polish government that the people are watching them and it's not just a domestic issue. Um, so that's one of the things. And then in the parliament, uh, we often have uh, discussions and resolutions about the situation in different member states. We've had it in Hungary and also in Poland. Um, so that's some of the things we're trying to do. And then of course in the in the women, women's committee and in the budgetary committees, we're trying to give more money to, uh, to what they called, uh, like to abortion rights and to uh, women's organizations working with abortion rights and to, uh, uh, to preventional care. Thank you. The, the European Union has got a lot of issues with Poland and Hungary uh, for years now, but, 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 but still, you know, this was last week, so still we have these is issues. So it's, it's not completely, it's not solved yet. Uh, Sylvia, what would you like the EU to do that, is, that it is not doing now? Um, uh, of course, uh, as uh, the European Parliament, we try to, as Kira said, uh, support Polish women and protesters. And it, it was uh, obviously this uh, resolution of uh, November 2020 on the fact of ban on the right uh, uh, to abortion in Poland. But uh, what is most uh, important, uh, for me, in my opinion, it is really high time that all women in the EU, no matter if they live in Warsaw, uh, Helsinki, Barcelona, Paris, whatever, uh, have the same rights. Um, and uh, we want, I want, uh, for example, uh, that uh, the scope of Article 7 uh, procedure against Poland to be expanded. Uh, on the human rights violations. Uh, I want the Commission uh, to confirm that the directive of 2004 on equal treatment in the access to supply and goods and services apply also to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, goods and services. Uh, I want to. I want to uh, the Commission to recognize that limits on and barriers uh, to accessing reproductive uh, health. Uh, uh, goods and services constitute a gender-based discrimination because I'm really sick and tired of hearing that the commission cannot act 
that these are not uh, the competences of the EU. Uh, I want the Commission, for example, to adopt guidelines uh, for all member states uh, to ensure equal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, I want, of course, uh, the Council to conclude the EU ratification of the Istanbul Convention. Um, uh, we can we can um, uh, talk about the, my expectations and our expectations uh, towards Commission, towards the Council. Uh, but uh, first um, and the most important thing is uh, um, uh, that the EU uh, uh, declares that uh, women's rights uh, are. EU, the EU policy, uh, and uh, and it's uh, as important as, for example, common agriculture policy, uh, and these are competences uh, of the EU. Full stop. Uh, so I I, I I can talk more about it, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, but shortly speaking, this is it. Yeah, thank you. That, that was a very long list as well, Sylvia, of things you would like the EU to do. But Kia, coming back to one of the things that Sylvia mentioned, uh, is this even EU competency? Because in, in the EU, in the Article uh, 2 of the, of the EU treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, it lists a lot of value for the European Union, and, and one of them is equality, and another, and another one is human rights. But is abortion uh, is that equality? Is it human rights? It, it, abortion is forbidden in other member states uh, and other Catholic member states of the European Union as well. Is it up to the uh, to the nation states or is it up to the to the European Union? Well, I guess it depends on who you're asking. Um, so it's true that that with the with the Istanbul Convention, uh, we also say that we can't. Uh, force a member state to to provide uh, legal access to abortion, uh, and to my understanding, like the Istanbul Convention is quite progressive and helps a lot of women in in acknowledging something like uh, psychological violence as uh, as a crime, uh, which is a really great step. Uh, but then, on the other hand, says that it's okay for for member states like Poland or Ireland to uh, to have a ban on abortion. Um, so. It's a difficult question, and I think if you ask lots of, uh, of legal experts, they would say that, that this is not EU competence and we can't force member states to, uh, to provide abortion. Uh, I would say that abortion is a human right uh, and that the EU has a responsibility to secure human rights for all Europeans, no matter what member state they're living in, and especially also to protect those people who are living in countries like Poland or like Hungary uh, or other countries where we see uh, a backlash on women's rights and LGBTI rights. Uh, so for me, I would say that, that this should be EU competences uh, and that we can't have a union based on more than just money and the internal market, but based on values where we don't have access to, uh, to abortion and where we don't have uh, human rights for all people. So yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> But, but is that a debate right now? Are you deba debating this stuff in the European Parliament if, if, if uh, abortion is, is a human right or equality? Well, I think my experience is, and maybe uh, Sylvia can also add to that, is that in the Women's Committee, there's an agreement that, that as, a, as a European Parliament, we can say that we want the member states to, to grant access to uh, safe abortions and to health and reproductive rights in general. I wouldn't say that we're discussing whether it should be EU competence or not, uh, but maybe an area where we can't discuss it is when we have the Conference of Europe uh, in a year, I think, uh, where we can also discuss treaty changes. Uh, and for me, it would make sense to also revitalize uh, this part of the treaty uh, and saying that, that LGBTI rights and women's rights and the more concrete aspects coming with those rights have to be eligible to, to all European uh, people. Mm, okay, thank you. I, I like to, uh, I, I like to uh, show you another picture as well, uh, because you mentioned already, already uh, Kira, the LGBT rights. So do you see this picture? Yeah. 
Um, this this picture, uh, the, the, it's it's the Virgin, uh, it's the Virgin Mary, the Black Madonna. She's called the Black Madonna in Polish, and she's got a rainbow halo. Uh, this picture is actually illegal in 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 Poland. Sylvia, C can you explain us why is this picture illegal? What what is it? Uh, why do the women carry it? Mm -hmm. Could you help us through here? Uh, I would say this picture is not illegal. Uh, but uh, we have this criminal offense in our criminal code uh, uh, to offend uh, somebody's uh, religious feelings. And uh, of course, the question is uh, whether the rainbow uh, offends somebody's religious uh, feelings. And some people in Poland think uh, it does, uh, and that's why we have uh, we have ongoing court case against Polish activists uh, that uh, uh, printed this picture uh, as posters and stickers and placed them uh, in public uh, space. Uh, uh, and according to the prosecution, according to public prosecutor. Uh, they offended religious uh, feelings of Catholic majority, and uh, that's why they face charges up to two years of imprisonment. Uh, the court um, has not judged uh, this case uh, yet. Uh, actually, next hearing is uh, uh, scheduled uh, uh, even this week, uh, but uh, during the hearing in January, for example, uh, a priest, a Catholic priest, uh, was one of the witnesses, and he was explaining uh, in very offensive homophobic language why, in his opinion, LGBTI people, because the rainbow is a symbol of uh, LGBTI community, um, uh, are against the people themselves, not the rainbow, uh, are against Catholic beliefs. Um, and um, uh, and I'm, I think this, uh, this case is really, uh, is really sad, but also I think uh, this is a manifestation of the situation of LGBTI people in Poland. Uh, they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, merit uh, that we, we don't have uh, civil partnerships uh, law. Uh, there is no um, uh, yeah, criminal offense of uh, hate speech or hate crimes uh, towards LGBTI people in our criminal code. So they are not protected, um, uh, protected uh, against uh, uh, hate crimes. Uh, of course, we can, we can also mention the uh, the, the uh, gender uh, recognition system, which is really uh, uh, actually it's a violation of human rights of LGBTI uh, people, um, and uh, uh, and uh, the the this that there is no uh, anti discrimination education at schools, and. Those examples uh, constitute actually uh, a, a situation of LGBTI people in Poland. And this case, this court case, shows um, what, uh, is, what, what the rainbow is for many people in Poland. The rainbow as a symbol of LGBTI uh, a community. And I think this is really uh, really uh, sad. Thank you. Kia, coming back to the EU competencies. In, in the EU, we value uh, freedom of speech. And, and the woman on that picture before, she has the right in, in EU terms to carry that picture. But doesn't, doesn't Duda, doesn't the Polish president, Andrzej Duda, has the same right to, to label LGBT an evil ideology? Bishop in, in Krakow, doesn't he have the same right to label uh, LGBT a rainbow plaque? And the education minister to, to, to say that LGBT has got the same roots as Nazism, which is clearly a lie, but doesn't, have, doesn't he have a, a right to say so, at least? 
all, all these 100 communities around Poland to call themselves free from LGBT ideology, since we have the freedom of speech. I think the, the discussion on freedom of speech is always uh, quite interesting and also quite difficult. Uh, I would say that, that we should go to really strong lengths to protect the, the freedom of speech. Uh, and I would also say that, that Duda has the, uh, the opportunity to say that he doesn't believe that there's more than two genders and, and a lot of weird things he's saying. Uh, I think for me, the difference is that like there's a difference between expressing an opinion uh, and then doing politics that are harming other people and other people's freedom and their rights. Um, and I would say that if you do LGBTI zones or if you are uh, banning strikes or banning abortions or doing a lot of these uh, concrete political uh, uh, things, then you're not just showing an oppression or an, an expression, you're actually like taking your expression, expression and your opinion on towards other people uh, and uh, decreasing their their kind of their freedom and their uh, possibility to to be who they are. Uh, so that for me makes the difference. Uh, I'm not sure if I would then say that we have to uh, like ban all people who are saying that uh, that they don't believe in in uh, in LGBTI people. Um, but I'm not sure about uh, where I stand on that. But I think for me. This whole discussion also shows that LGBTI people and their rights uh, have now become a political battle zone where we can actually debate and discuss what kind of rights people should have. Uh, and for me, that's the most scary part about this. And I think it shows both in, in Poland, but also in, in a lot of other European member states um, that there's a war between, or maybe not a war, but like a, a, a discussion uh, on what kind of world we want to have. If we want to have uh, like this very conservative uh, religious world uh, or if we want to have a world with freedom for all uh, and that there's also a fight between values um, that's for me what, what this is also an expression for um, but I think in general that if you have and back to the freedom of speech that for me it's more important to defend people's right to, to be who they are than to defend people's right to express something mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kia. And, and thank you for also mentioning other countries because the case today is Poland, but it is, uh, of, of course, it applies to other countries in the European uh, Union as well. In, in a short moment, I'll open the floor for questions from all the participants. So you're very welcome to write your questions in the chat for Tina Menzel. But before I do that, Silvia, I'd like to ask you, because uh, I think the European Parliament you, you, you're quite clear on this issue. You, you almost agree on a lot of these things, but the European Commission, is, is that's something else. And, but the Co Commissioner for Equality, Helena Daly, she tried before last year, she tried to make LGBT issues a part of this rule of law mechanism. So if you break the fundamental values of the European Union, you cannot have European Union funds, but she didn't quite succeed. So what do you think, what, what will be the next step from, from, the, from the European Commission now? Um, I uh, appreciate uh, the efforts of Helena Dali uh, on this uh, uh, issue, but um, uh, mostly uh, we can hear from uh, Helena Dali about determination and dedication, and we cannot see any uh, actions, uh, unfortunately. Um, so uh, more actions, uh, not only words, uh, I would say. And uh, I, I just would like to add to what Kira uh, said, uh, the, freedom, uh, the freedom of expression doesn't mean you can say everything because homophobia, racism, uh, uh, being anti-Semitic is not an opinion, uh, as simple as that. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, I find the result of the summit uh, you mentioned uh, a failure uh, of the negotiations in the Council. And, uh, and I know, and it, 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 we can clearly see uh, the Polish and Hungarian governments won uh, this battle. Uh, and 
it shows us like uh, the EU uh, is almost powerless uh, uh, and weak uh, against uh, their actions, their actions against uh, rule of law and against uh, fundamental uh, human rights uh, of women, of minorities, of LGBTI people. And uh, I am strongly in favor of the budgetary rule um, and the mechanism, this conditionality mechanism, but uh, we need uh, to understand the rule of law uh, more uh, broadly, not just as uh, independence of judiciary and freedom of media, for example, but also as uh, as a matter of uh, you know, fundamental uh, uh, fundamental human rights, and uh, uh, and uh, fundamental human rights cannot be uh, a subject of any negotiations of any compromise. Uh, and maybe I'm uh, idealistic, uh, and I have this idealistic approach, uh, but uh, I think it's really a time for the European Commission to act and not uh, just uh, to conduct a dialogue, to negotiate, to, uh, to have meetings and conversations with Polish and Hungarian governments. Thank you. Perhaps there'll be someone to, today here at this meeting from the European Commission, so they should take notes now. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll open the floor now for questions or comments or whatever from, from our participants. So you write in the chat for Tina Menzel and she'll make a, she'll make a list. And Tina, you, you got some questions already, I know. Yeah, yeah I got a question from Paul Ladehoff. If you'll turn on your microphone, Paul. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have that question. Um, could you be inspired from the development in Ireland, where the Catholic Church also had, has had a great influence? What has the people and government in Ireland done to come to the actual stage where there is free access to abortion? I can say I am a, um, a gy gynecologist and uh, obstetrician, and I have been on, on a course in, in 1980s to Dublin in North National Maternity Hospital and has been attacked by doctors because I was coming from Denmark where there was uh, free access to uh, abortion and I had to defend myself and my opinions uh, with these doctors. And there was very strong rules at that time, but now they, are, they, have, they have free access to abortion. And uh, as I know, the prime minister is a, a gay so uh, there's uh, another opinion in Ireland than now, and how has they come to that? Thank you, Sylvia. I think it is for you, and uh, perhaps you can elaborate how, how popular is, is Ireland right now in, you, in your government back in Poland? Hmm. Um, we uh, obviously um, observe the situation in Ireland and the, its developments uh, very, uh, very strongly, but uh, we need to, uh, to uh, take into account that uh, we have a very conservative government in Poland right now. The, in, the influence of Catholic Church is really, really strong. And this is, this is uh, actually a systemic war. Um, uh, uh, Vibe mentioned uh, before in one of her questions. The war, this is uh, uh, the war which is conducted with public money, with a huge... Uh, resources of far-right organizations, non-governmental organizations. Um, and uh, this is a war against women. And we don't have, we have, uh, comparing to the, to the island, we, we, ha we do have um, different quality of democracy in Poland. And this is one thing. Uh, and the second thing, we have very weak, um, uh, weak um, uh, non-governmental organizations and the public debate 
uh, is actually uh, inspired, organized, uh, and conducted by far uh, right organizations instead of democratic forces. So um, I cannot see uh, uh, the opportunity for such a change as uh, was uh, uh, was uh, 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 as took place in Ireland, uh, we can have uh, in Poland right now, unfortunately. Okay, thanks a lot. Kira, Kira, I, I talked to, to Sylvia before about uh, about the Helena Daly and, and what she's doing now. Clearly, since we had the, the rule of law mechanism just before Christmas, so everyone agreed we have a rule of uh, law mechanism. There's a conditionality. You can only have EU funds, funds if, you are, if you're applying to EU values. But this happened last week about all the, uh, these, uh, th this new law about abortion. So the Polish government is clearly not uh, abiding this, this new rule of law mechanism. So wh wh where do you see, wh what should the EU do now? Um, well, yeah, I think it's true that the Polish government doesn't really care about what a lot of uh, EU bureaucrats are telling them how they should uh, run their country. Um, but, and I think like the first, the biggest step we can do is to have a rule of law mechanism that's working. Uh, of course, this rule of law mechanism is a compromise also with Poland and Hungary, so it's not perfect. Um, and we've, uh, for the last two or three years, has been trying to push for a proper one in the parliament among the different political groups. So that would be the, the biggest step. Um, I think what we have to do in the meantime, and then of course also to have like human rights as a basic part of the treaties in general. Uh, but what we can do on, on the short run and, and currently, I think is to be aware of where we can defend human rights in the different political areas. So for example, when we talk about free movement uh, and employment politics, um, we we all agree, or like the EU as a whole agree, that we have free movement and, and all workers should be able to, to work in different countries. And with that free, free movement, we can actually also demand that, for example, LGBTI marriages are recognized in different states. Um, so that's an aspect where we can, can do a lot of things. Uh, and also to our support for different organizations. So when we give support for regional funds or social funds, we can also earmark some of it for, for, for an example, sexual or reproductive rights or uh, people who are in vulnerable situations. And the same when we give support to public medias, we can also ask for the independence of, uh, of national governments. I think that's some of the, the things we can do already now. And I hope my sound is okay now again. It's it's fine. It's fine, dear. So so it's not only in the in the rule of law uh, mechanism. You you can do you can use a lot of instruments actually. Yeah, but of course the rule of law mechanism and the like the basic treaties are the most powerful uh, tool we have. Yeah, Sil Sylvia, are you here still? Okay, I think Sylvia's connection, she's got a weak connection. I think she'll, she'll be back. So Kia, Kia tells, so, so we, we can use other tools as well. It's not just the rule of law mechanism, but are you actually discussing these things in, in, in the European Parliament as well? What other tools to use? Yeah, well, we were discussing when we had the different LGBTI zones uh, in Poland, uh, LGBTI free zones, um, the commission actually stopped some of the fundings for these cities because it was uh, used from one of the, the EU funds. Uh, so we can do some. Uh, and the same when we discuss free movements, we also, uh, from some of the progressive groups, have quite a lot of a focus on how we can ensure the rights of, of women and of, uh, of LGBTI people and of, uh, of other vulnerable types in, in general, not to say that, that women are vulnerable. Um, so we, we do a lot in, in those areas. But of course, we have to be even better at thinking about it. Yeah, because when the EU did that, when the EU stopped supporting uh, the, these LGBT free zones, then the Polish Minister of Justice just tripled the amount that this city would have had from, from the EU. So, well, it, it's a fight. It's an ongoing fight. But Tina, you have some other questions, please. Yeah, 
I got a question from uh, Les Bascos Association. Good, good, bad. <laughs> Sorry, uh, my pronoun. Yeah, uh, if you can turn on your uh, your microphone. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, I, I want to know how uh, can uh, the association and, and the LGBT association in France in. Uh, Denmark in uh, in Germany can help the Polish activist to to struggle against uh, against the Polish uh, policies. So that's a very clear question. Can LGBT uh, organizations in other countries help the Polish one? Sylvia, I think I think Sylvia lost the connection right now. Melina, perhaps you can help uh, Sylvia getting back. Kia, Kia, do you have do you think that the LGBT organizations in other countries in Europe could help uh, the Polish one or the Hungarian one? Yeah, I think so. And and thanks for the question. Uh, of course, uh, like I'm not an LGBTI person, so I shouldn't be saying how you should help. I think it's it's up to the organizations to to also uh, say what is needed. But I think something we have to be aware of when we're coming from countries like Denmark or Germany or France and also uh, the LGBTI communities in those countries that we have more progressive legislations. We're not like we haven't reached the goal yet of, of total freedom, of total equality, uh, but we have more privileges than, than LGBTI people in, in Poland, for an example. So we also have a responsibility to, to support and to help. Um, I think some of the, the things I've considered is to, uh, to join the, the LGBTI or the Pride March uh, in Poland next summer, uh, hopefully if Corona uh, will, will let me. Uh, so I think supporting by, by either going to the Prides or uh, by supporting online can, can do a great help. Um, but I think the best thing is to reach out to the organizations as well. Okay, thank you. S Sylvia, I think, you're, I think you're with us now. Okay. Uh, yes, sorry, I, I've lost uh, the connection. Uh, I'm in the European Parliament, but something is going on with the internet. But yeah. I'm here. Well, that's <laughs> so it is for all of us. <laughs> so, but we are so glad you're back, Spurik. There was a question if, if perhaps um, LGBT organizations from other parts of Europe, if they could help the Polish uh, LGBT organizations. I think uh, every kind of the support and help is really needed here. Uh, the systemic, uh, legal, uh, some uh, gestures, uh, very symbolic ones, but also they are really uh, needed because what we have here is a really, uh, you know, all these organizations and informal groups are struggling, uh, fighting, for life, uh, actually, uh, trying to help uh, people uh, who, are, uh, who are excluded, uh, discriminated against, who are uh, victims of, uh, of violence, uh, cyber violence or violence on the street. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of LGBTI um, uh, organizations in Poland, so you can uh, uh, easily contact them and ask what you need, what kind of help you need right now, because I think it's just, you know, the simple question, but uh, this is a simple question, but, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's just, uh, uh, just a matter of, uh, of uh, uh, individual um, needs and, uh, and very uh, uh, current situations that are uh, going on in Poland right now. Okay, thank you. Tina, yeah, yeah, and I, I'd just like to add that the ILGA, uh, the big uh, European uh, LGBT uh, NGO, listed Poland as the worst country in the EU to be LGBT uh, I in. So Tina, but you have, uh, you have more questions. Yeah, I got a question from Rasmus Nerlen Sørensen. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, Sylvia and Kira, uh, if you find support for women and LGBT rights in the EU Parliament. There's a lot of different political groups, 
but is there sort of a majority who wants to help or a majority who can put pressure on commission and on, on member states or what, what kind of support do you find? Kia, would, like, would you like to start? Um, yeah, I can start. Um, well, I think there's quite a good support. Uh, I've actually been uh, quite positively surprised when I joined, uh, coming from, from a country like Denmark, which is quite progressive, but where being a feminist is still kind of something you can't say. Uh, where my, my impression is that in, in the European Parliament, uh, most MEPs uh, from lots of political groups see themselves as feminists fighting for LGBT rights. Um, and I think, yeah, for me also, of course, Commissioner Dali is, is like she could do more, uh, but she's also coming from Malta, which has been doing quite a lot of great things on, uh, on transgendered people. Um, and the commission also appointed uh, an equality commissioner for the first time. So I think there is some support, uh, but of course it could always be better. And when the like legislative proposals are not coming, it's it's in some ways also empty words. And and uh, Sylvia, would like would you like to add something as well? Uh, I think uh, I, I totally agree with Kira. Um, we have a quite good uh, network of MEPs uh, that uh, support uh, the goals, the values, the standards. Uh, there is this uh, intergroup of uh, on LGBTI uh, that uh, that we uh, participate in, um, and uh, there is a movement towards uh, more rights rights and more guarantees for LGBTI people, for women's rights. Uh, but it's obviously uh, not enough because, you know, in the 21st century, we are still discussing uh, basic uh, issues such as uh, uh, whether somebody is or not safe uh, in his or her home own home, uh, whether you can be yourself, uh, you can be happy, uh, you can love uh, whoever you want to. Uh, so uh, we need more support, obviously. Okay, thank you. Please remember, if you do have comments or questions, uh, write in the chat for Tina Menzel. And somebody did that, Tina, right? <coughs> Yeah, I got a question from, from Mathilde Hansberg. If you want to turn on your microphone, Mathilde. Yes, um, I'm just curious about and what- your video as well, Mathilde, if, if you got a video, please. Uh, my camera's broken, that's why. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But I'm just curious about what you're trying to do about this problem, meaning the lagging support um, about abortion and the LGBTQ plus community. And um, does the EU not represent a well? Does the EU not present a criterion in which human rights play a crucial role that all members must abide by? Well, that's about the competencies as well, Kia. Back to the competencies. Competencies. Yeah, and, and thanks for for the question, uh, Matilda. I think uh, what is the the problematic part and. What makes it so difficult is that from an EU side, we can't really sanction member states. Uh, so we can't sanction member states if they are breaking the, the rule of law, for example, as we've seen in, in, in Hungary, or if they're breaking human rights, as we see in Poland. Um, so the EU hasn't, have, well, hasn't got all of these tools that we should have. Uh, and I think the reason for this is that when we established, or when someone established uh, the European Union, I wasn't born. Um, you, you couldn't imagine that, that you would see a backlash on democracy and a backlash on human rights. Uh, so it's an aspect we are fighting with now and where the rule of law is a good tool uh, that needs to be improved. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question. Otherwise, let me know. Thank you. But, but we do have other tools because we have the, we've got the Article 7 as well, but it just, it just seems to be not that tool that someone was hoping for in the beginning. Sylvia, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, I, uh, I totally agree with Matilda and, uh, and I think, and this is a very sad uh, conclusion uh, because uh, we don't have a time to consider whether 
the European Union should act or not uh, within this area of fundamental rights. Uh, because uh, if the uh, European Union uh, doesn't act on this, that it won't be any Euro the European Union at all in the future. Uh, there is no time or to, to think for the European Commission to consider, to conduct a dialogue. Uh, e everything took a lot of time, too much time. Uh, European Union and European Commission needs to act right now. Otherwise, there's there is no European Union. There is no uh, community. Do, do you uh, agree, Kia Marie? Do you... Thank thank you, Sylvia. Do you agree? It's it's so urgent now, and it's so vital for the European Union that if the European Union doesn't act now, we won't have a European Union in the future. Do you agree? Yeah, like I think maybe the institution will still be there, but I think it also depends on what you define as, as the European Union. And for me, the European Union represents a set of values uh, like human rights. Um, and we don't really see them represented in, in all of all of Europe. Uh, so I agree with Sylvia that if we if we don't act, we will lose these values that are precious to the European Union, at least for for me and for a lot of other people. So, yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Tina, we have more questions, right? Coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question from Vibeke Lund, and um, she asked me to to uh, to ask it for her. Um, she writes, "If the U EU would take the step to stop sending money, what would Poland do?" Yeah. Sylvia. That I've been always uh, saying uh, the conditionality mechanism is not about uh, uh, stopping the money for, for Poland at all. It's about uh, stopping uh, giving the money to the government. Uh, it's about uh, 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 it's about uh, uh, providing uh, 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 local governments and NGOs with the money without any, uh, any uh, participation of the government, because the government is the viola perpetrator of these violations, uh, not local governments, not NGOs, not Polish mm -hmm. citizens. So this is just about uh, some technicalities, which are very important, uh, but it's not about, uh, about uh, uh, Poland losing uh, its, uh, its money. It's about the go Polish government uh, as a perpetrator. Yeah, and I know I know the mayor in Warsaw, and actually the mayor in Budapest as well. They've got some excellent suggestions on how this should work out uh, practically. Yeah, so so yeah, so and and uh, European money, European funds. Uh, well, a lot of the European funds goes actually um, not not to the government, but in the countryside to to different kind of projects. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Tina, you, you've got some more questions. Yeah, I don't have uh, more questions, but um, I got some information. Or, oh, Steve, uh, uh, you wanted to share some information uh, with everyone. Comment. Yeah, please, Steve. Sure, thank you. Um, so, I actually joined in my role with Copenhagen 2021 World Pride, but I'm also a board member of the European Pride Organizers Association. In relation to what was happening in Poland in 2019, <clears throat> our members um, set Poland as a strategic objective for us to support the pride movement in Poland in terms of smaller grassroots prides just getting off the ground and holding their first event. And so we reached out to other prides around Europe. We raised an initial 30,000 euros, including a, a good donation from Copenhagen Pride. Um, and a year ago, last January, we brought all Polish pride activists together in Warsaw for the first time. Um, and we developed an action plan of what they needed from us, from other civil society organizations, from the EU, from various agencies. 
um, and develop this action plan. But then, of course, the the pandemic hit. So we still have that uh, action plan. We still have the contact, really close contact with activists in Poland. And we're sort of ready to activate that and activate prides around the world in supporting Polish pride. You know, one of the easiest ideas was that we'd ask the Polish community in London, for example, to carry a banner in the Pride in London parade to say, look at what's happening in Poland, everyone, and let's raise awareness and visibility that way. So there is a plan. There's more on our website at epoa.eu. Um, and, and we'd welcome any other engagement. But the, the Pride movement is kind of raring to go and support as, as much as we can. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I think there's lot, lots of people are very happy about this that, that, that you're seeing now. But it doesn't seem that, um, well, it doesn't seem, Kira, Kira know what's, what's going on. The politicians in the EU know what's going on. And, and you actually have uh, not, not just prides in, in Great Britain or in Copenhagen, but you have lots of people, you have millions of people on the streets in Poland, in Poland, just right outside the government's building and outside Kaczynski's home, but he doesn't seem to care. So Sylvia, what, what to do? Oh, what to do? Uh, it's a really important question and uh... Uh, and uh, and there are different uh, different strategies. Uh, uh, people will continue the demonstrations, organizing the demonstrations for sure. Uh, the second thing is um, uh, sending uh, applications to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which is a legal tool uh, within Council of Europe system. And of obviously, it doesn't question the judgment of constitutional tribunal, but European Court for Human Rights can uh, rule uh, that uh, Poland uh, violates fundamental uh, rights. Uh, and it's uh, more than just a symbolic uh, gesture. Um, what we need right now is uh, to support NGOs and informal groups that support women, uh, that help women uh, in uh, in uh, their uh, enjoyment of uh, human women's human rights, and I think for now in this situation, um, uh, it's very important in uh, in uh, in a few days, in a few uh, a few coming uh, upcoming weeks. It's very important to support such organizations. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. I, I never thought about myself as enjoying human rights. I just thought that I had them, that it was my right. So this is a new word for me. Thanks a lot. Do we have another question, Tina? Yeah, we have a question from Casper. You... That's going to be the last one then. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, and I'll try to, to, to speak quickly then. Um... I was wondering, and we've been skirting around the issue, which maybe ties into the larger question of what the European Union is and what the European Parliament is. But as members of the European Parliament, how do you balance reacting and being proactive? Now there's an issue. There is a concrete law that somebody is demonstrating against, and then you take pictures and you go out and you say stuff. But in between these moments of heat, there's a lot of time, right? Is it feasible to imagine that you as politicians or your parties will make commercials in Poland? I know there has been horrible commercials with fetuses on cars driving around in, in Warsaw and, and other kinds of propaganda against abortion, right? right? Is it possible that you, when it's not a heated political debate about a specific law, could bring this agenda of you can be who you want to be and LGBT rights and, and stuff like that into the political debates in, in member countries like Poland or Hungary. It's going to be a very short answer. Kira first. Um, yeah, thanks for your question, Kaspar. And I think uh, it's, of course, always a balance on, on when you react and when you're being proactive. Uh, I think one of the 
the greatest roles as the parliament is to push the commission and to push the member states uh, to present legislation that protects people or saves the climate or do all of these things. So I think in that way we are proactive. Um, and then also, I think we have quite some time to also go out and, and join activists and join the prides and so on. And then it's just about prioritizing to do that, which I guess a lot of us can be be better at instead of just sitting in front of our desk. Uh, yeah, so I think that would be my response. And then I will leave the, the floor to Sylvia. Yeah, very, very short, Sylvia. Do you have any breaks in Poland, in Polish politics, where you do not have drama? No. <laughs> um, I think, I wish we could be just uh, uh, proactive instead of being uh, reactive because for now in this current situation we need to react all the time and what other governments because i didn't mention it uh, before you know what other governments but what governments of other countries could do is to support uh, polish women uh, in uh, terminations of uh, pregnancy by financing these, uh, uh, ser this healthcare service within their uh, healthcare system uh, in order uh, not to, uh, not to uh, force women to pay for abortions abroad. And it would be a great help for women in Poland. That was a very concrete measure. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, all of you, for joining us today from all over Europe and even from South Africa uh, in, in such large numbers. Thanks a lot. It, it, it was amazing. And thank you, Kira and Spurek, uh, for, for debating uh, women's rights, LGBT rights, EU competencies. I'm, I'm very happy to, to have you here uh, again another time. Uh, so, and we'll be back. We'll be back with more, of course. Thank you. And please, please turn on your microphones, all of you, and then we could, uh, you know, in a proper way, say thank you for Kira and, and Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.